Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Here at Cabinet HR, we're currently sign up people on wait list to help us with our beta testing for the Cabinet HR platform. To sign up for our beta testing, go to www.cabinetshr.co. Also, this Friday, I'm going to be on the Devin Metrics 2 Minute Drill. It's a, a pitch competition this Friday. That'll be on Bloomberg TV and Amazon Prime Video. So it'll be great if you check it out. Our guest today is Walter John Whitehead. Walter, are you ready to be great today? Yes, I am. Walter is Managing Director at Madison Street Capital, LLC. We advise on mergers and acquisitions and corporate finance transactions. Prior to joining Madison Street Capital, Mr. Whitehead was founder and managing partner at Hunter Barron, a lower middle market investment bank focused on capital raising and M&A advisory services. He graduated from Clark Atlanta University, where he, earned a, where he earned a bachelor's degree in business administration with a dual concentration of finance and international business. Walter, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> uh, one thing that's been um, really prominent in a lot of my conversations with various like uh, strategic partners, institutional partners, and and some colleagues alike over many years actually has been, um, you know, this racial wealth gap and what we can do collectively to help close that racial wealth gap. Um, and specifically, like what, what happened, um, you know, praying for the family still uh, with George Floyd kind of sparked uh, this global conversation and a lot of corporations have been stepping up to the plate to do specific things regarding launching diversity, equity and, and, and inclusion. Um, divisions of their organizations, as well as like um, like movements or, or specific uh, entities within their firm to kind of push uh, this conversation and not just a conversation, but to get action behind it and start to make some substantive changes regarding closing this racial wealth gap. And um, I've been doing a lot in it and, and, and I'd love to kind of, you know, see some of your thoughts and maybe you can ask some questions on what's been happening um, and how, how we've been actively moving to help close this racial wealth gap. And this is part of what you did, uh, I think it's called fourth NVMT. Yeah, that's, that's the, uh, like the logo It's actually pronounced fourth movement. It's a uh, movement is a uh, abbreviated in that uh, logo, but yes, that's exactly what I was doing. And how long, and how long were you with them? You know, I was with them uh, from the, its inception to about two years. Uh, the organization, Fourth Movement, uh, if I can kind of step back a bit, the name Movement, uh, Fourth Movement rather, derives from Dr. King. <clears throat> what he would often say is that if the African American experience could be likened to a symphony, that symphony would be in four movements. These are like exclamation points in our time here in the United States. And he said the first movement of that symphony would be um, us getting, uh, us being emancipated from slavery, that would be like the first movement. The second movement would be us getting our right to vote. The third movement would be us getting our civil rights, which is what he was actively uh, doing uh, in most of his, his uh, I would say in his arc that you would see like in Dr. King's history. And then towards the end, he was working on that fourth movement with his essentially economic uh, parody or economic, um, yeah, I'll say economic parity uh, is, is what that fourth movement is. And so the organization that I was, that I was working with and consulting with, um, their primary existence was just creating economic parity. We were working specifically in the cannabis space and I was advising this company um, from an um, investor relations standpoint. I was with them when we helped raise um, around a little over 15.2 million. Uh, essentially, this organization had an opportunity to really help advise um, individuals who were negatively impacted um, from the uh, war on drugs. And these individuals, the city of Los Angeles specifically, and then also the city of Chicago and a few other cities around the country here in the United States, were, were giving priority when they were issuing licenses to either cultivate, manufacture, um, sell uh, cannabis. And so um, that with that priority, it came with a very interesting, interesting thing because that same demographic that was given priority who were negatively impacted. If you kind of like, you know, do a kind of test, you'll find that these individuals aren't, aren't, aren't as business savvy or, you know, really equipped um, from like a, an economic standpoint. 
And then from just a business savvy and, and financial literacy standpoint as well, to truly take advantage of that priority. And so we were stepping in to help consult and, and, and help advise and make sure that they just, they're just not competitive, but that they're actually positioned to win specifically. So, I mean, you have all these cannabis companies making, I mean, pretty good money, right? But then on the other hand, you got all these people still in prison for it, right? It just doesn't seem right. True. Something like this doesn't seem True. wrong. Like, how do you fix that? Like, True. Yeah, with that, that conversation is, is, is really, is really specific towards a lot of legalities. And so, <laughs> what, what, and so granted it is an issue and a lot of folks are, are, are doing some really uh, impactful things and making things happen there. I'm not really equipped to like speak on that per se. Uh, my heart goes out to that and, 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 you know, and, and I'm in full support of a lot of folks who are, are have initiatives who are moving forward um, and, and making some substantive changes there. Um, what I did after I was working with Fourth Movement is I pivoted toward uh, my true passion what I was doing prior to Fourth Movement, which is investment banking, specifically investment banking. And so uh, while, I'm, while I'm working with Madison Street Capital, it's a Black-owned investment bank. Uh, we're in the middle market, it's headquartered in Austin, Texas. You know, I sit as managing director and I help primarily with um, its expansionary efforts towards making uh, very formal relationships and partnerships uh, with large uh, private wealth managers um, uh, around the world, really. And so we've been successful in establishing some of those uh, relationships and, and I'm just riding that uh, momentum. And primarily it's a conversation regarding the diversity, equity and inclusion. The idea is, is, is helping to close that racial wealth gap. And so we're, we're in a unique uh, position to um, help business owners uh, around the country who are existing clients with some of these uh, wealth wealth managers. Yeah, back to cannabis real fast. Like, I can't tell you what to do. It just seems like the right thing to do would be like, you're making millions of dollars on cannabis to give a certain percentage of like a legal fund or something, right? But that's, like you said, that's another conversation <laughs> another time. We go to, that's another rabbit hole we can go down maybe yeah. later. So yeah, sure. back, back to the, um, here's a question for you. How do we fix this? Or maybe that can't get fixed, right? You know, uh, there, there's a lot of solutions all, all over. You know, a lot of people are, have been working toward it, especially after, um, you know, the whole George Floyd incident and, and that, that murder, what happened. It was like public murder, right? And, and after that, you know, a lot more attention has been given to us like, hey, we have to do something here. We have to do something here. So a lot of people have been stepping up. So like large institutions like, you know, JP Morgan and, and I think Goldman Sachs is doing something and, and Merrill Lynch is doing stuff and, and Alliance Bernstein. A lot of folks have been stepping up. McKinsey has actually launched an, an institute, you know, the McKinsey Institute. Um, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot the name of the, the full uh, organization, but McKinsey Institute of, I'm not sure what the name is, but, but they're, they've launched stuff. It's like, it's like research institutes, et cetera, to like do, you know, what, what, what you know, people kind of like step in their role and kind of do what they can do. And people are, 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 I guess, proposing a lot of different solutions. And I think more than just throwing money at it or, or giving free stuff or, or you know, giving folks a, a break rather, I think uh, a solution would be something around cultivating, I think, a culture, cult cultivating uh, um, an affirmative, you know, like culture of like, you know, like work ethic, responsibility versus, versus uh, accountability and kind of just getting it done. And I pulled this, I pulled this uh, solution from what I've seen over, over time and in history across different you know, generations and, and, and different cultures even, I mean, different cultures, specifically in African cultures, Asian cultures, Middle Eastern cultures, and European cultures. I've seen folks who kind of were the oppressed seemingly or like the, the low class in terms of an economic standpoint. And these folks kind of cultivate a very specific culture of just responsibility and work ethic and, and just, you know, more inward than outward, you know, taking inward responsibility, inward development, um, you know, inward, like we're going to just, you know, you know, dot, dot the I's and cross, cross the T's. And they kind of like pull themselves up and, and you kind of just see like an incredible things happen in, in, in these African cultures and these Asian uh, cultures historically. And then even here in America, like I read, read, read like a, a few books that kind of highlight, you know, certain African Americans, like this is pre-emancipation, pre-1865, who kind of just cultivated that unique culture either with themselves or in small groups. And they kind of just begin to kick ass and take names and close uh, this economic gap between them and their counterparts. So how do you solve this? Or is this, is this a problem that does not need to be solved? 
So you, you, you have two, two people graduating from college. One person comes from like a middle-class income. Both yeah. their parents work, you know, they went to like, like, they went to like a Stanford Duke, you know, they yeah. can take a gap year, take a year off. They really don't need to work, you know, so they can right. maybe go work for a startup for free, do that kind of stuff. Right. Sure. Other person come from a single parent background, two mm-hmm. or three brothers and sisters. They pretty much have to get a job, right? They can't take a year off. They can't work for a startup. They need money now. Right. No way around the person with the single parent household gets a right. job at 80,000 a year, which is all fine and dandy. Right. But the other person mm-hmm. potentially could make millions and millions of dollars. I just think, mm-hmm. how do you fix that? Right. Or is it just the way life is? I, I don't know. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think um, uh, I think there is no problem. I think that is just the way life life is. I think opportunities are subjective, you know, um, versus like objectively right, objectively wrong, or needs to be changed. I think one interesting thing I, I've noticed, like from looking at history and stuff, is that I often approach like. For a long time, I wanted to fix the problem, you know. Um, and in my community, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. I wanted to fix the problem, but I realized that, you know, when I did this unique interview with my family members, I, it, uh, my wife and I were, were married just last year, and we started to formalize our family, right? And so we have these this family archives is what we have, and what, what we were encouraged to do is that, hey, let's kind of record the elders that are currently alive. And just like this, a very setting, not, not too different from here. What we did was we recorded a conversation just like this for about two hours with like the oldest members of our family, both of, uh, both of our, our parents, my parents and my in-laws and some aunties and uncles. And we asked them questions regarding their political beliefs their um, their economic beliefs and standpoints and, and what they believe in and what their religious beliefs are. And then one of my favorite questions is what will, what what do you want to leave your uh, family? You know, like not just your, your children, but what do you want to leave behind for your family? Like, you know, and they kind of were, were not in a position to do any like economic, you know, gifts or like any kind of like bequeathing or anything, but they gave like just, just unique, um, sayings or, or adages or like my mother for example wanted wanted us to remember and to receive from her inherit from her is forgiveness and understanding that you know my father talked about the importance of knowledge and then my one of my my father-in-law he mentioned peace of mind you know and then my mother-in-law talked about love and then I, it was on my heart for some time right and so I was like, I wanted to revisit this whole platform and really dive deeper on that particular question. And, and we call those like, we call it the, le- the legacy lectures. And so we have this YouTube channel where we're gonna be releasing because our wedding is there and then we're gonna have like this family stuff there, like family archives. And we're gonna just be asking this thing called legacy lectures where my mother kind of just drilled down on what she feels about forgiveness. And so the beauty here is that not, not, when, not if, but when she passed away, our, our children's children's children can always go back and look at these videos to see, you know, their great, great, great grandmother talk about what does she want them to inherit from her, right? That I think is, is something that is available to them. And what I've realized from doing these, these lectures, Jason, um, these, these interviews, I, I pulled different insights that a lot of people are happy. It's like, it's, I don't know, it's the difference between happy and content. It's, it's more so like they're, they're there's not a, you know, they don't, they don't see an issue where you see it. It's just so subjective. Like you go into the community and like, Hey, I want to, I want to give you guys shoes and I want to give you guys freedom. They're like, what is freedom? They're like, we don't need shoes. Like everything is fine. And you kind of come in with this kind of, I think it's like almost like an imperialistic kind of attitude of like what they need. And, and, you know, it's, 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 it's really fascinating when you dig down. However, I'll say that with a caveat, right? Cause there are no absolutes. I don't believe there are instances where you go into certain communities that you feel need something from you, right? And you go in there and you kind of see somebody who's raising their hand, they're seeking some kind of help. I think those are individuals who I think you can really make a substantive impact on. And I say that because I think the only thing that we, humanity, kind of like needs from other people is just acceptance. I define love is just in one word, acceptance. And I think if you can go into like certain communities that we think the narrative, the popular narrative is that they're downtrodden and they need our help or something, something like that. I think when we go down there and look them deep into their eyes and souls, more than anything, they just need love. I think if we can just accept them, period, you know, accept them, you know, and 
no, nothing more. I think it'd be great. And then when an individual leans a little closer to you, Jason, and they kind of like ask for your help in some kind of way, I think it is at that moment when the student is ready, the teacher will appear and we can either learn something from them or we can kind of help them in some kind of way. But I almost think there's a, there's a, there's a tinge of, of, of arrogance and imperialism when we kind of go in and do like, no, nah, you need this. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, <laughs> it's kind of weird. It's kind of absurd when I, when, I, when I think about it a little longer than usual. That, that legacy thing you're doing, that's powerful, right? I, mean, I would do anything better, turn on a YouTube channel and listen to my grandmother, great grandmother, someone from the past. That's, I really like you what so you're much. doing. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's so powerful thing. right there. And that's actually where it came from. My wife and I were cleaning up one day and I never had the opportunity to meet her, her, her maternal grandmother and her family. I mean, I'm telling you, bro, I've, I've been with my wife for like seven years now and uh, every single time from like the beginning to now, when more than two family members are around, their grandmother comes up and I'm just like, I just wish I was seeing this woman, got a chance to hear her voice or something, but I only know her through two photos, that's it. But if I could just see her move and hear her voice and kind of hear what she wanted to the family to really, you know, inherit from her, it would have been something meaningful. And I think what's good about it too, that. you might, you, when you, when you, if you have kids, you might tell your, like your daughter, you're just like grandma so-and-so. No, I'm exactly. not. And pop the video up. Oh my God, I am just like her. You're right, exactly, exactly. And so, and so we're, 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 we're praying for moments like that. We're praying for moments like that where, you know, like my, my, my children and their, and their children and so on and so on. And then even it's a blessing because we're able to step outside of our, our, our parents and in-laws and go into our aunties and uncles and they have children and children. And so they already have great grandchildren and stuff. And so it's just going to be something special when they can go back and look at their, their, their great, great grandfather, talk to, you know, their great uncle or something like that. And kind of just, you know, ask them questions about their spiritual beliefs, their political beliefs, and then what do they want us to inherit from them? Not just their children, but what do they want our families to inherit from them? And it's, it's, it's kind of, it's real special. So this is a kind of a deep question, but what do you want your legacy, to, your legacy to be? You know, I am the possibility of people uh, being empowered, fulfilled, and fully self-expressed. And, and, and I kind of move from that, from like, all standpoints of how I roll. Like with my family, um, my wife and I, we, we break our lives up into quadrants, right? God, family, career, and community. And, and in that order, we prioritize our lives that way. God first, then family. And then after God and family is like stabilized and enriched, then we move on to our career. And then when those three, God, family, and career are like stabilized and enriched, then we feel like we can truly be some kind of impact into our community. And so because I define myself as a possibility of people being empowered, fulfilled, and fully self-expressed, um, what I really want my legacy to be, it's, it's, it's going to be people. It's going to be, uh, you know, people being touched, moved, and, and inspired, you know, by what I'm pouring into them in terms of, like, empowerment um, and in terms of them, like, really being fully self-expressed and not kind of being in, in with themselves or with their family or with in their in their at their work environment or in their community kind of like not not speaking you know not feeling bound or like kind of in prison but truly truly being fully fully self uh, expressed uh one thing that that i know uh, i've been doing that through is this 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 morning regimen i created in 2015 um where i was striving to create like the perfect morning like I, I grew up, like my mother, she raised us on like Les Brown and Napoleon uh, Hill and Earl Nightingale and, and Tony Robbins. And so she was really big in like personal development. And so I was just raised hearing those tapes and stuff like that. And so naturally when I was in college, I had to study this stuff myself. And you know, when you get into these books, they always talk about what you should do every morning is this and then that. I'm just like, man, it's like a whole lot of stuff to do. How do you? So I was like, I'm going to do this. And so I was like, I want to say exercise, meditate, pray, write, and read every single morning. And so I created this acronym to kind of help me remember this. And so it's E-M-P-W-R, and it's pronounced empower. But it's exercising, meditation, prayer, writing, and reading. And, and the writing portion is unique in that it, it goes into, like, a couple of years ago, one of my uh, best friends, he, we spend New Year's with him, and a lot of our friends kind of get together every New Year's and bring it in together. And do like, you know, it's affirmations and we do vision boards and stuff. It's really cool. 
And so he gave, he gifted us all these five minute journals. And this company is called, I think, intelligentchange.com produced this five minute journal and it's backed by uh, a lot of like, you know, personal development gurus and stuff like that. And folks who are like, I think it's Tim Ferriss, who's like really big on the four hour work with whatever he's backing it really heavily. But it has like different sections where you write out affirmations and, and gratitude stuff and all kind of cool stuff. And so um, I've just been pushing it. And for me, I think I've never grown so much spiritually, like in my life until I started to do this meditation through Agape Spiritual Center. And my exercising, I utilize the Nike training app where I do about maybe 30 to 45 minutes of like a high intensity interval training, or I just do my own exercises or stretch or just take a break and kind of do active recovery, do like yoga or something. Uh, but I do this every morning, like from 5 a.m. And, and then over the years, I've added a, a, like a ton of other things like supplements and cold showers and Wim Hof breathing methods. It's a lot of like, it's a lot of intense stuff. And so I actively generally share this when I talk to people generally. And they're just like touched, moved and inspired. And they kind of started doing it and sharing people. And my friend came back and said, hey, I told, he's a teacher and he's an assistant principal. said, I've told all of my students about this and they've come back with all this stuff. And, and then I've heard like organizations like all bought like 50 journals and they kind of did all this stuff. And it's a lot of cool stuff happening, you know, with it. And, and I think I'm, I'm embodying who I am, you know, the possibility of people being empowered and being fulfilled and being fully self-expressed and often when I speak with my family and do things like the um, the uh, legacy lectures and the memorial conversations what we call the initial conversations and so on and so on it's kind of just what it is and so I feel that that's going to be uh, my legacy like from from 30,000 feet for sure 100 percent and do you still do cold showers a thousand percent yeah so what I do is I, I do like a regular shower and then uh, when I rinse, I just cut the cold cold shower on. And for, and I'll say like for the first few weeks, maybe it's like pain. <laughs> it's like it's like what are you doing? But I often just try to remind myself. And I, I derived this from uh, Wim Hof. It's W I M, uh, and it's pronounced like with a V, like Wim. And then Hof, H O F. And he has an app as well. It's pretty awesome. And he has breathing. Uh, through it, which is really, really incredible and very helpful, but and it helps your body becomes alkaline. And then the cold showers generally help, you know, strengthen your blood vessels to kind of uh, reduce the pressure from your heart, you know, and pumping blood throughout your body. So it kind of strengthens your blood vessels uh, for for heart heart reasons. It also increases uh, brown fat, which it helps in enhance with the uh, weight weight loss. And then it generally wakes you up, it's energizing, and it's just, just a lot of, it's a ton of other health benefits I'm overlooking and missing, like skin and all kind of stuff. It does. This is like freaking amazing. Yeah, I, I've done them the past. Rinse off, I might as well I, do I've it. done the past too. I need to get back to doing them. But people say, you do a cold shower, you're crazy. What's you doing, right? The first yeah. thing that you do, cold shower, yeah, I am crazy. What the hell am I doing here? Yep, yep, yep. But then after a while, it's, it's now, it's like my body looks forward to it. I can barely, like, it's not even. It's, it's like it reduces the amount of pain, but also too, to me, it kind of is like a microcosm of life sometimes too. I, when I'm doing a lot of my studying and stuff, um, a, a lot of it, like for, it takes more step, step backs, right? My wife and I have these quarterly meetings, just the family, just my wife and I, it's just us, we have no children. Um, I have over 20 nieces and nephews alone though. And then my sister, and then my, my wife has a lot. And then, so we have a lot of nieces and nephews and they call us all the time. So, so anyway, so it's just she and I, and we have these quarterly family meetings. And so at the end of each quarter, we kind of reflect on what just happened and talk about the present and have goals for the next quarter. And this quarter, I've been really focused on uh, what my mantra is, is fall in love with the, with the pain of change, right? It's a good one. It's the fall in love with the pain of change. Because I've noticed that, you know, a lot of like what, what's going to be necessary to like change and improve this like facing pain and pressure. It reminds me of like, you know, uh, Frederick Douglass said, without struggle, there is no progress. You know, and when you go to, and in the world, when you go to the gym or you work on a skill, whatever, you kind of face resistance. Yeah, it's never the perfect time to launch a business. It's never the perfect time to have children. It's never the perfect time to do a lot of things. You have to just adjust and go through some type of pain of change. And so my mantra is like, whistle while you work, you know, like just go into it, you know? And to me, cold showers kind of help with that. When you do these cold rinses, it's like, physically it's like, oh my God, it's about to be painful. But then you know that it's gonna be all these benefits you can barely remember and list. It's like, it's gonna be good for you. Like going to the gym, like it's going to be good for you. 
yet your body is resistant to it, like lifting the weight or, or running for X amount of miles or hours, but you do it because you know it's gonna be good for you. And so I think when, when I acclimate my, my physiology, my body, my psyche, my, my psyche, my psychology to just going into it and whistle while I work, it's to me, it, it, it normalizes doing it like, you know, for a meeting or when I'm about to close a deal or an opportunity that I think is gonna be high risk. I know it's gonna be a uh, high risk or gonna be painful to maybe speak up or do this, but I'm willing to fall in love with that pain and move toward that pain in an effort to realize getting on the other side and giving birth to that butterfly going through that um, metamorphosis for a while and that change is gonna happen. And uh, yeah, so I, I totally dig it. And it's a, it's, a, it's a beauty to it, I believe. But isn't it amazing how many people out there say, I want to do better at X. I want to start a business. I want to learn a skill. I want to, I want to fill the blank in, mm -hmm. but what they do, they get home after work, put TV show on or, you know, whatever. Yeah. I think, I yeah. think someone, I think Gary Vaynerchuk famously said, you know, don't complain about not doing better in life. If you're on three softball teams, right. Or something like that. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. But it's, it's, it's the thing, you know, I, I love people. I love humanity. I think it's the irony of humanity. You know, like we, it's like we all love the the glory, but nobody wants the story, right? We want to watch the story. Like when it's a when you know the ending, you want to see it. You know, but it, it's it's funny when when you're in that story, when you're going through the story, like you rarely ever see people talk about like, hey, I'm in the valley right now. I'm sleeping in my car. It's rough. My wife divorced me. I'm, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you don't, I you don't see that. My job. You don't want to highlight and announce the, the the valley, but when you're finished, when you're at the finish line, you're gonna be like, "Hey, you guys may not know it, but I was fired from my job. I lost my wife. I was sleeping in my car." You know, people always talk about it in, in hindsight, and so uh, and then also too, it's just it's just more comfortable to kind of like eat barbecue and popcorn and 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 have like the being anesthetized, being uh, uh, anesthetized by different drugs and stuff to like not feel the pressure of like uh, of life whether it's alcohol or any kind of like opioid or, or addictive substances or substance abuse that's like easy and that's comfortable and then those drugs are, are inducing whether it's any kind of thing right it's, it's the challenge this is why the mantra I think was so um so prominent I was like I realized that the awakening was like the the growth is in the pain like the, the diamond exists in the pressure that the coal is able to withstand. Like that's the, that's the beauty, it's the pain. It's the pain that you have to go through it's in the gym. Like when you, when you, when it's the most painful is when the muscle is developing, when you're running and it's like, you wanna quit, that's when you really go. So it's right there, I'm like, I wanna fall in love with that pain this, this quarter. I, it was, I think Muhammad Ali said he, when he did sit ups or whatever he did, he didn't start counting until it started hurting. When you hit the wall, yep, that was on a Schwarzenegger, Muhammad Ali, yep. It's like, as soon as you hit the wall, that's when it starts. And I think that same uh, analogy and that same, I think that 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 in nature corresponds, I think, with life as well. When you're like in the business, like in the HR business or whatever you're doing, like when it's when it becomes tough, that's when the, that's when the diamond making process starts. That's when it's made, for sure, for sure. For sure, for sure. And so, and that, and that kind of ties back into the culture I was referencing in terms of closing the racial wealth gap, I think that it's a culture where the work ethic has to be praised and, and, and loved. And I, and I think hip hop kind of kind of is moving in that direction. I think, I think like I think in like the early two thousands, like when Fifty Cent was cracking and all these other guys, whatever, they were talking about the whole "I'll sleep when I'm dead" and and like they kind of like made sleep and resting vilified and they undermined it which is which is a bit it's extreme but it's a bit incorrect for sure you definitely want to balance yourself out and rest but my point is that they were emphatic about work ethic and and, and grinding and like, i'm on a grind and stuff and i think that spirit of like work ethic in a healthier way is healthy to promote so so i think the the culture of like not feeling entitled or not feeling not the, the culture of holding other people accountable. Like, like it's almost like going to the gym and demanding somebody else do your reps for you or something <laughs> like, right? Like, and hoping you're gonna get, get big or helping you gonna like, you know, improve. But it's like, nobody can lose weight for you. You have to hit the gym on a, on a regular basis. You have to have dietary habits. You have to sacrifice, you know, not wanting to do X, Y, and Z or eat X, Y, and Z for eating better. 
and and you you have so much that you have to do internally you know to to be great whether it's dietary habits whether it's like your dietary outcomes nutritional outcomes economic outcomes lifestyle outcomes social outcomes nobody's going to network for you you know like you you have to do you have to take 100% full responsibility and i think all these things uh are, 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 are embedded in someone's culture. And so when somebody is like adapted to that unique culture of responsibility across all these verticals, that individual I think is, is primed to realize a certain set of outcomes, regardless of their circumstances and conditions with your example of those individuals in college, right? Regardless of their, uh, their social, their circumstances and conditions, they're gonna be realizing a certain set of outcomes based on choices that they deliberately make which I think can be influenced from their culture. Because we see the phenomena, right? Where people come from economically strong families and people come from economically weak families. And then they, they'll, their, their, their children will produce uh, contrary outcomes, right? Where you get like the story from rags to riches all the time. You always hear those stories, right? It's almost like, oh, of course that person did that. And then you hear people who were like born into a great economic circumstances and conditions, but then they in turn, because of their choices, realize different outcomes. We, we see that often. So it's, 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 it's I, I, I got two examples. Like you talk about the hip hops being like hard workers. I just yeah, happened to yeah. listen to these videos like a couple of days ago. So I watched a video with Buster Rom. He was talking about back in the early 2000s. Yeah. He was basically a song with Eminem. And so he said Eminem, but eight, an eight verse track. Eminem sent back a 12 verse track. So I could go back and right, forth. Right. Yep. And yep, Buster was like, that. Eminem was in a full tour. He was in a full tour. So I have a full tour going on. And they're still like grinding, writing these rhymes back and forth, right? <laughs> and another example was when uh, that a uh, song Drake did, uh, I think Forever Ever or something like that. And Eminem had that famous verse. Yep. yep and uh, yep. Connor West, like he said, like he's seen the verse. He's like, I cast everything for two weeks because I care. Like <laughs> I got to He's like, he like top eight for two weeks to do redo his verse over and over again, right? He's seen Eminem's verse, right? And That's people awesome. don't get that with hip hop or music in general, right? The hard work they put in, like the hone oh, their man. craft. And with anything oh, in general, you got to hone your craft. Yeah, yeah, a thousand percent, one thousand percent, and and honing craft requires practice, dedication, sacrifice, responsibility. You know, you it's, it's really challenging to put responsibility on somebody else. Nevertheless, I, I still would say I know a lot of times when people, you know, preach independence versus dependence, uh, which is very common. I think it's a, a beautiful thing, and um, I believe it was. Um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People uh, by Dr. Stephen Covey, uh, rest in peace, man. He had this beautiful maturity continuum in the book, if you can recall, where he mentioned that in the beginning of the maturity continuum, it starts off with being dependent, where you have language of accountability, like so-and-so owes me this, and so-and-so has to do this for me, and, and I failed because this person did this, or I'm this way because of my spouse, or I'm this way because of my mother and father. Or I'm, you know, they're just very dependent and holding everybody accountable. That's where it starts off dependent. Then it evolves into independence, where a person say, "Hey, it's gonna if it's gonna be, it's up to me." These are the self-employed people who are kind of like, you know, specialists. You know, they're 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 barbers, they're hairstylists, they're doctors, they're attorneys. They're like, I am self-employed. I'm in, I'm independent. It's gonna be me. And it's what we're talking about now, independence. But I love how. Stephen Covey kind of, you know, he caps it off, not there, but he caps it off at interdependence. And I think that's the beautiful part where it's like we, it's more of like not quite dependent, but not quite independent, but it's interdependence where you kind of are able to empower somebody and have faith in somebody, you know, who is independent to deliver, you know, it's, it's cooperation, it's synergy, it's synergistic. And, and I think that's where I'm still working on that. But that's that's a, the beautiful thing about business systems, right? When people are, are truly able to cooperate, you know, um, they're operating from like a co-expecting, almost like a co-faith maybe having, you know, it's co-operation, right? So, you know, you're like, even like, and then these things happen with when two or more people are together. So I think if you if you can master this interdependence, even with your spouse, you know, and even in your family with your with your children and, and with your family and then your broader family with your parents and in-laws and cousins and sisters and stuff. And in business, that's that's what happens, you know, it's interdependence, whereas nobody's quite dependent. You know, although you may have some people in the organization who are that way, and everybody's not quite independent, but you have 
interdependence. I think that's like an a, a awesome goal to strive for, interdependence. So on your LinkedIn, you liked the article a few days ago. It was yeah. um, basically, it was um, your best may not be the best. And I talk about mm -hmm. Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 yeah. hours. How you work three hours per day is going to take you nine years. And yeah. how you speed up the process. Can you talk about that song? Yeah. That was my guy. Yeah, it's my guy, Amadou, man. Amadou is doing awesome stuff with uh, Mac. You know, he's with, uh, I, I, I know it's Mac Ventures, but they they collaborated with Cross Cross Culture Ventures. And now they have, God, what I think it's like, like MAC. I'm not, I'm not sure, but they're doing awesome stuff in the movie industry. I think they just produced uh, the Black uh, Mas uh, Messiah. They're doing some really awesome stuff there. So yeah, it, it's, it's just in terms of like, he shared this awesome stuff, man. Uh, one of his mentors was talking about the importance of the 10,000 hour rule. This is the idea of work ethic, right? And it's the same culture. Like, you know, he's associated with an organization um, doing really amazing things in the film industry, right? They're not waiting or complaining about so-and-so not giving them an opportunity where they're dependent, where you, you often hear these narratives, right? We can't make it. And, and they're Black American, right? And I believe I'm a dude. He, he may be like African African, but he, he he's he's a minority nevertheless. But he's not. He I, don't, I never heard him say that so and so's not doing this or so and so's not doing that or so and so. You know what I mean? They're not dependent. And then in terms of independent, they do show quality of independence because they just kind of like launched their own thing and they're doing their thing, right? Independent of like maybe major major labels. But what I can see for sure is interdependence, right? the spirit of like them collaborating with major organizations, like them bringing value to the table and then somebody else bringing value to the table. They're collaborate uh, mutually beneficial, um, you know, synergies and collaboration with major institutions, what I'm seeing from those guys. And to speak specifically about the article and the, and the, uh, the post that I like regarding the uh, 10,000 hours, Malcolm Gladwell, shout out to that, to, that, to that brother, man. It's an amazing thing that's often, often referenced, but it's the importance of like, you can go ham and do those 10,000 hours, right? And you work for years, 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 whatever, right? Now you're at the top of your industry, right? But now you're surrounded by a culture of people who also did <laughs> 10,000 hours plus. So now everybody here, the floor is 10,000, it's like years of experience and matching the crap. You just have more and more work to do. You got to continue to strive and push where iron sharpens iron where you are the company you keep, you are who you attract. So everybody is just on like a whole nother, you know, just masterful level. When I mean, you know, when you're, when, you're, when you're like a fifth grader, you know, in a kindergarten class, you're like the God of earth because you're, you're the sharpest person there. But, but then when you're finally get to a really like, you know, awesome place where, where everybody is on a high level, it, it, it it, it, it literally pushes you to, to even a higher stratosphere. So that was what, that's what he was sharing. The fact that, you know, when you're killing, you start to attract other awesome people who are like sharp in their career. And then now you're just another awesome person. So you can just kind of, it, it pushes you to kind of just do even more and do even better and do even better, you know, which is, which is a beautiful thing. And again, it, it, it beckons my whole point about responsibility, responsibility versus accountability and cultivating a culture where that is the norm, where I used to I say this thing amongst my friends where I'm like, uh, we want to, we're striving to normalize, a few quarters ago, <laughs> my mantra then was like to normalize the miraculous, right? Where people often say like, oh, wow, like you did this or that happened or this closed or, or this deal happened or you acquired this asset, whatever. And everybody's like, wow, that's freaking amazing. But when you are creating a culture where the miraculous is just the norm, you, that that's, again, goes with what Amadou was saying, right? Where you normalize the miraculous, where something happens, it's like, that's what's up. It's just Tuesday. Cool. Next day, next day. And then your whole life is just incredibly miraculous. But to you, it's just, it's just Thursday, you know? So let's go back in time and go back to when you were in college at Clark Atlanta. Sure. So Clark Atlanta is an HBCU, I believe. Shout out. Can yep. you talk, talk your experience at Clark Atlanta and why why decision to go to HBCU? And just a quick definition of HBCU for, for in case anyone does not know what that is. Sure. HBCU is an acronym for historically black college or university. And it 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 is a set 
of, I think it's a little over 100 universities here in the United States that were established um, sometimes, some as, as early as like the emancipation era, or like right around that time of 1865. I wanna say Atlanta University was established in 1865. I wanna say, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you guys, but, uh, but they were established right around there and some a bit before, but it was during a time where segregation was a, was a thing and was the law and we had to be uh, separated in different institutions and they still exist. And there's a lot of different articles, McKinsey put out an article uh, recently uh, that was justifying uh, the necessity, the continual necessity of historically black colleges and universities today. And this article was published by a dear friend of mine, Dwayne Pender, uh, he's the author, he's, he's an uh, associate partner at McKinsey and he's a part of the McKinsey uh, Institute as well that was derived out of the George Floyd uh, uh, massacre. And he um, kind of makes this case and it was just published like recently, I wanna say it was like maybe like a week or two ago. And, and currently it's, uh, it's like we're in August, 2021 right now. And it was published maybe like in July. So anyway, uh, the university was, was incredible. Uh, the reason why I chose to go there, uh, when I was in high school, one of my friends was just kind of selling me on the idea like, man, like HBCUs are incredible and the marching band and it's just like this cultural experience you're gonna have is great. At the time, I went to a preparatory school, Washington Prep in South, South Central Los Angeles. Um, and we, I was in a magnet program. We were big on like colleges and universities and applying whatever. And I applied to like over 20, got to like 20 plus uh, universities. I had, to, I had a chance to choose from that I accepted and four of them gave me a full ride scholarship. Uh, it was an academic and I chose Clark University. That was one of the ones I had a full ride. And I chose that one, I only applied to that HBCU because my father was from Atlanta. He mentioned he's from Atlanta and a lot of my paternal family is there in Atlanta area, but it was a transformational experience for sure. Like at Clark Atlanta University, I learned a lot at school and in school. I mean, it was, it was a great school, but <laughs> I learned a tremendous, a tremendous amount of life lessons at Clark Atlanta University. Uh, not just within the curriculum. Um, and it was a lot of like life lessons regarding, you know, just like sociology and how to move. I got really into uh, reading in terms of, uh, I started to define wealth uh, through Robert Kiyosaki text. I was exposed to that from my dorm. Like my, my, my RA was like, here, read this. I read it twice in one sitting, it blew my mind. I started to like really develop my library of different other books and learn a lot about you know, um, theology and, and different theologies around the world. I mean, a ton of stuff. And when I was an undergrad, <clears throat> one huge exclamation point at, at, H, at, at Clark Atlanta University was the founding of a nonprofit, uh, the Vanguard Leadership Group with some buddies of mine. And it was an organization where we really pushed leadership skills. And so we had, it, we had our own separate curriculum regarding um, just, how to become, I guess, like like a really awesome person, really. Uh, and it, it was uh, really well-rounded in terms of like having uh, religious sensitivities and studying different uh, the theological books, uh, spirituality, quantum physics, being politically aware. Uh, we encouraged every member of this nonprofit at Clark University to get their passports, to study abroad, specifically on the African continent. And so I studied abroad at the University of KwaZulu Natal in Durban, South Africa. Folks studied in, in Kenya and Cape Town, all over uh, the continent. We encourage people to push in their academics and be exposed to other uh, PWIs, specifically the Ivy Leagues, to kind of get a well-rounded educational uh, experience, not just not just academically purely, but even socially. And so I had a chance to take a pre-MBA. Uh, course, uh, this pre-MBA program at Harvard Business School when I was an undergrad, we encouraged internships. So folks were interning at like Google and PNC and Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch and Goldman Sachs, whatever, like all over. And um, we, were, we opened this nonprofit to both male students and female students at all three institutions that were major and open at the time. Uh, for undergraduate studies, it was Spelman College and Morehouse College in addition to Clark Atlanta Unit University. And we attracted some of the best and brightest and these folks went off to do really incredible things and uh, in politics and um, and government work specifically in politics um, and business and um, different other fields. It's, it's, it's really, uh, it was really diverse, incredible group. 
and everybody had a chance to study abroad. And we worked really closely with the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. And we all, a lot of us traveled to Israel and, and went down to DC and lobbied Congress for various reasons. We helped in various political campaigns that were local in the city of Atlanta as well. That was the major exclamation point in my historically black college experience, but it was truly transformational. One thing that I'll say that's very, that was very palatable for me was I was often discouraged <clears throat> and encouraged, not, not to you know, make it all one-sided. When I was discouraged to go to Historically Black College University, uh, the narrative was, the popular narrative was the fact that I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. That was a lot of African-Americans. And I don't want to continue to go to a university that was just surrounded by a lot of African-Americans. But what I realized when I got there <clears throat> and made the right choice of attending a historically black college at Clark Land uh, University was that despite the <clears throat> aesthetic homogeny of African-American, African-American or black, 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 that was pretty, uh, that, was the, that was the majority. It was very heterogeneous and diverse in terms of its specific nuanced culture. Whereas I never tasted jambalaya from a person from New Orleans that was made in a dorm, you know what I mean? And then I had, I had friends who were from Canada, you know, but they're black. And I'm like, oh, tell me about what that's like. And they had French accents and stuff and people who were from Africa and they're or from Europe but they were, they were black British and, and they were like black. They had British accents, they were black as me. It was so cool. And then people from like Texas and people from New York and people from the Midwest and people from you know the DMV area, DC, Maryland, Virginia area and Geechee people. People with, who were Geechee and I didn't even really can understand their, their accents but they were black. And I'm thinking everybody's gonna be like LA black but <laughs> no, nah, people from the Bay Area are slightly, slightly different. So despite it being mostly uh, people from the African diaspora, for sure, it was incredibly diverse in terms of culture. And it was very rich to get that full spectrum of the African diaspora all in one place. And we did have other, other uh, races and ethnicities there as well. So it was an incredibly diverse. So after, after that, you also went to Harvard Business School. Oxford uh -huh. at Trinity College and your Durban and South Correct. Africa experience. Can you talk about Correct. how each one of those impacted you? Yeah, it, it was it was incredible. It was it was incredible. For, for the record, um, I was accepted to the uh, Oxford Trinity uh, Trinity School, but I wasn't able to afford uh, to go there. <laughs> um, that's like the but, Oxford that everyone talks about. Yeah, it's Oxford. Yeah, it's Oxford. So Oxford is spread out into different colleges. It was Trinity College uh, specifically through the OSAP program, the Oxford Study Abroad program. And so um, specifically the African uh, experience was, uh, again, transformational. Like I, you know, obviously, you know, like, um, well, maybe not as obvious, but like I was bombarded with a lot of, I guess the classic narrative that, and during my time growing up was that Africa is what you see on the Discovery Channel. And you kind of get this idea that's very narrow-minded of like a certain portion of Africa and like the, the rural areas and stuff like that. And, and so going there, I was super excited, uh, obviously influenced by hip hop. And this was a scene in Belly that always stood out to me uh, towards the end when Nas character, <laughs> he's like, he's, he's turning a new leaf and he's, and he's going to Africa. He's like, man, my wife is going to Africa, man. And, and he's like, and then towards the end, he's like, he's, he's speaking over the track and he's like, we get to Africa and like the sky is a different color blue and the trees are a different color green. <laughs> And so that's all in my head, like, oh, I gotta go to Africa. And so when I'm going, I'm touching down and I'm literally like crying. I'm so moved by just being back home. I felt like I was going back home. You know, uh, one of my one of my, uh, my aunties, my great aunt, she's the, uh, like the matriarch in our family, um, Eleanor Moody Shepherd. Uh, she talked about like going in Ghana and visiting, you know, the, uh, the Middle Passage area. And it's like this inscription I'm not sure if it's in English or not, but um, it translates to English as like, you know, the door of no return or what the, maybe what they, what they referred to it as. And they say, when you go through this doorway and you fall off in a slavery, you're not gonna ever come back. And, I, and she's mentioned that she had this awakening where she was like, the, the awakening moment was that they, they lied to us because we did come back, like I'm back, like as, a, as, a, as an ancestor. You know, or rather as like, you know, part of that lineage, whatever, she came back. And so I was literally in 2007 feeling that like I'm coming back home and it was very moving for me. And um, 
to see the grass. And I was looking like, is that a different color green? I don't know, it's not. <laughs> but, but, but to get into the weeds of the experience, it, the transformational aspects, it, it, was, uh, it was beautiful like to be accepted by so many people. I mean, it, it was flattering to me. It was so flattering to me when, when Africans would approach me and just begin speaking like Kosa or Zulu, assuming that I know the language and I'm just like, <laughs> and I replied like, brother, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And they were like looking at me crazy, like, oh, okay. And, and some people thought I was faking, like I was acting like I was from you know, the States. <laughs> that was so flattering to me as well. The acceptance, you know, how, how I define love is simply as uh, acceptance. And, and I felt so much love, so much acceptance being there. And, and it was, I felt a little uh, spoiled and at, an, at an advantage because I wasn't just visiting for a week or two or like a day or so, but I had I had the um, I had the um, the blessing and, and the uh, the the gift of being there for six months from January to June. I was there in, in South Africa and I uh, I studied in international business and so it, it it was cool. And one of my favorite courses was African music and dance. To take African music and dance in Africa, it it was it was special. Like uh, I'm I'm a dancer. Like deep down in my, my soul, I danced when I was in high school, uh, not formally, but like at like you know some like you know dance trip or whatever. And so to take African music and dance in Africa was amazing. My teacher said some really, you know, affirming words to me towards the end about my my dancing uh, abilities being like pretty unique and great because she teaches people who major in dance and. That was awesome and very, again, like just the acceptance of like, man, this is incredible. Um, and I still keep in touch with a lot of my friends that I, that I made in, in, in Africa, actually, who are from uh, Johannesburg and, and, and Durban or Cape Town. And we still talk to this very day. It was transformational. After returning, I had like uh, the traveling bug. And so I spent my next spring break in um, Milan uh, to go some European stuff just a little bit. But primarily, I spent most of my time in uh, Egypt for my last, my spring break following that in 2008, which was, again, like tear jerking to be in Egypt, like tear jerking to be on the, under the pyramid and to be on the pyramids of Monograd. It was incredible. It was incredible. And uh, Harvard, um, that was great too. Like Harvard, <laughs> transformational. Like it's it, again the the program. Um, it's called Summer Venture Management Program. I think it was started by Jim Cash, who, um, uh, Dr. James Cash, I believe he's a doctor, but he's a, a professor of emeritus at Harvard. He's on the board of like, he's African-American. He's on the board of like, I, at the time he was on the board of like Microsoft and, and Walmart. I mean, just major, major Fortune 500 companies, incredible human being. And I think he started the program to really just target individuals who were not, who were not commonly seen in MBA programs, who thought they were kind of like, it was not for them. And so thousands of people applied to the Summer Venture Management Program. It goes by SBMP for short. It's for rising juniors. And um, they take about, let's little under 100 every, every year, like maybe 60 something students a year, whatever. And we, we spend time there during the summer and we literally are like living on campus. We're, we're in our cohorts as if we're in an MBA program to kind of just get that experience and to kind of just feel like it's possible. And it was transformation, it was great. I mean, I'm, again, from that program, I talked to several people, some of them on a daily basis, uh, still keep in touch with, you know, the guy, Dwayne Pender, who I told you, who wrote, as associate, he's associate partner at McKinsey, who wrote the article about, you know, the relevance of HBCUs today. I met him at the uh, SVMP program at Harvard Business School. And so we still talk, obviously, and so that's my guy. So it was so, all transformational and encouraged me to kind of just keep thriving and kicking ass and taking names. Yeah. So when we were a kid, you want to be like superheroes, rap artists, sports people, entertainers, firemen, policemen, on and on. I don't think many people want to grow up to be in finance. When, <laughs> when, when did you decide you want to be a, have a finance career? How did that come about? Yeah, that's funny. That's funny. That's so funny. So to be honest, man, if I can be vulnerable and transparent here, one of my family pillars is authenticity. So um, my wife and I, we have three pillars uh, in our family. It's agape, authenticity, and spiritual freedom. And uh, I try my best to be as authentic as possible. And sometimes when I'm about to say something that I think is a little bit against the common narrative, I just, I just like to preface it from time to time. So <laughs> I honestly just wanted to be rich, man. And, and when I was like 
I don't know, when I was growing up in South Central, man, my mom primarily raised us economically on credit. And um, she she wasn't, and she still is not like the most financially literate human being. And, and I talk to her still and, and we go through stuff, but you know, you know what you know, and you accept what you accept. And so um, growing up, there was a, there was more, there was a lot of like, we don't have the money. There's a lot of, there was a lot of replies that were like, we don't have the money when you, when you ask for stuff sometimes. And, but, but, you know, it's, it's all subjective, right? There were some people who lived off, who lived pretty, you know, different. I mean, I did, I still grew up in America, right? So having the ability to kind of study abroad in South Africa, I seen squatter camps and I seen Google let you in, in Johannesburg and, and, and different, you know, like encampments and stuff. And it's, it's different. Like when they say they're impoverished, it's like, you know, you build your house from scratch, from scrap metal and stuff. And you like rig some electricity and you take your, I'm talking like, we wasn't like that. So like, so nevertheless, I still wanted so much more. And, and, and I realized that lifestyles of rich and famous existed and people had it. So I just honestly wanted to be rich, Jason. And so when I was exposed to different professions, I wasn't choosing from a place of like, you know, I, I, sometimes I was like, I'm fired there because it seemed cool or it looked cool or whatever. But very quickly, I want to say before I was 10 years old, like very quickly, I, I realized that I wasn't choosing from a place of like, oh, that sounds cool. I wanted money. Like I wanted money. So I was entrepreneurial from a very young age and started to do stuff. I remember when I was nine years old, I went to the uh, Inglewood Library on 111th and Crenshaw. We lived in Inglewood. Uh, I, I went to roll my bike at nine years old to um, the Inglewood Library. You know, they had a little offsuit campus right there on 111th, 111th Street in Crenshaw. It's still there. And I checked out the ultimate credit handbook. I forgot the author's name. But I learned about Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, and FICO scores, and where it derives from, and breaking all that stuff down. And I just was studying, and and at nine, this is before I was ten, and I was like, I want to be rich. And then that evolved into wealthy, and then that evolved into I want to be financially free, and then that evolved into I want to be free. I want to be like a free man. I, and, and, it, and I'll go through the details of what that meant to me at that time. And then now currently is, is spiritual freedom is what it's, it was just one of my family pillars now, spiritual freedom. But it evolved from rich to then, <clears throat> from just rich to then spiritual freedom where I'm not bound, you know? And I believe like once you're spiritually free, it then translates into um, mentally free and then physically free. And a part of physical freedom, I believe this economic freedom is how um, physical freedom can manifest. Not always, but it can manifest in economic freedom. And so um, it was always just, just balling. And so when I was around, I think my, my teens and in high school, whatever, I started to like see, well, I was like, how can I work close and close and close with money? So there was like accounting, I wanted to get closer you know, to money. And then I saw it was private wealth management and then investment banking. Then I looked at compensation and like professionals for in certain uh, professions. And then what is their compensation typically? And that eventually led me to like entrepreneurship and real estate. So I, I'm, I'm a consummate entrepreneur, although I'm managing director at Madison Street Capital. Um, I still have outside business activities to where I'm involved in a lot of different other business ventures and consulting, uh, strategic consulting for, for, various, for various clients of which I'm partnering with, I'm partnering with, and we're doing like some pretty cool stuff. You, you bring a good point about, about uh, being poor, right? Cause I was in the army for 25 years. And just like you, I've seen places where they put the cattle pee on poor, right? And I'm oh, wrong, yeah. like, I'm wrong there's, there's poor people in America, but I mean, if you go to places like I've been to, like, it was like, like you said, destitute, they know the first next meal is coming from, they're sleeping on right. dirt. I right. mean, it's a whole like, different level of poor. It's real, it's real. And I'm like, man, you're in America. Like your floor, the floor of poverty is pretty high. <laughs> like it's relative, right? The floor of poverty is super high globally. You know, it is. So I want to get your thoughts on this. I'm I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing this. I don't exactly remember what I read. I think there's a group discussed on Core a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago. And the discussion was like, like you know, if you made everyone equal, right? Like if Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, everyone in the world started twenty five thousand dollars, what would happen? Yeah. And the consensus was in the group that. 95% of the people doing well today will still do well. 
95% of people not doing well are still not doing well. Right. There's courses I like, like maybe it's a guy in Kenya or or Cambodia who got money, they like, they would rise up, you know. But the consensus was everyone doing well now probably would still do well because you have to work, still work at the same brain, same stuff like that. What's your thoughts on that? It's with the consensus, a thousand percent. And it ties into my solution that I'm proposing in terms of closing the racial wealth gap. It's culture. It's at the end of the day, a thousand percent, it is culture. You, it, I think a lot of times people kind of have this like low resolution, 30,000 feet oversimplification solution of like, if a person is homeless, just give them home. You know what I mean? Like, like, like no, that's not that's so resolution. It reminds me, I was reading this book by Jordan Peterson. I love that guy. His mind is incredible. Uh, it's called Beyond Chaos. This is his latest book. And he gives this example where he says like the Monty, Monty Python camp, right? They have this joke of like, it's, they give instructions on how to, how to play the flute. <laughs> and they just like, you blow into one hole and you move your fingers up and down the rest of them. That's it, <laughs> right? And it's kind of funny because it's like, it's a very low, it's true. It's a low resolution. It's like, yeah, that's how to play the flute. But it's a lot, it's a lot more technical than that, right? <laughs> like, it's uh, and so I think a lot of times when people give solutions on how to solve poverty and how to solve, you know what I mean, close the racial wealth gap, it's oversimplified solutions that people get really enthusiastic and get behind, like, yeah, just give them money. Where it's like, you know, like these programs that people are doing to where people are just, you know, reparations or just giving people money, you know, it's like if they're broke, they need money, just give them money. If they're homeless, give them a home. That's that's not it. I, I think. I feel like I know because I, I just studied it since like my childhood until now. Now, granted, I'm not a genius, but like I, I've I've seen people kind of like propose solutions, and I've seen this. It's, it's this beautiful uh, book uh, by um, uh, Thomas Sowell. It's called um, "Black Rednecks, White Liberals," and uh, I love that book. Man, Thomas Sowell is a freaking genius, but he gives. He gives uh, one of his essays, uh, it's entitled, Are Jews Generic? And he gives this, um, he used this term frequently throughout the book. That I, the first time I heard the book, the first time I ever heard the term was, was reading this book, but apparently it's a very popular term identifying a certain sect of people. And it's, it, he ref, he's, his term is called middlemen, middlemen, mi, middlemen minority or the middleman minority, where he kind of highlights this, this global phenomenon that has taken place uh, centuries. I'm talking about, he identifies the Armenians and the Ottoman Empire, like when they kind of like the genocide happened and identifies Jews in, in Germany, Jews in America. I believe he identifies the Yoruba people of Nigeria. And then, so it's, it's across different like Middle Eastern, Asian, and, and all, top, all types of different cultures and stuff where these middlemen minority have existed. And then here in Southern California, I'm in Los Angeles, the Korean people, uh, the uh, Korean people who are who are really thick amongst uh, Black Americans, you know, um, they're considered middlemen minority as well. And he, he highlights this phenomenon because, and where it's relating to this solution situation, right, making everybody equal, oversimplify solution. Again, it's like that's not what creates wealth. Money does not create wealth, but who you are attracts wealth. It's not what you have, but what you have is the result of who you are. You know what I mean? It's like money doesn't make you, you make money, right? If that makes sense, right? So people, it's almost like you look at a race and it's like, give everybody trophies. And it's like, no, like you don't just get trophies to get trophies. And again, you focus on the end result. Like, no, practice, exercise, <laughs> do your thing, do all this work. And then because of who you are, you then earn a trophy because you then come in first, right? Because you hit harder or you run faster or you're more coordinated as a team, you know, you're then awarded that. You don't just, don't just give people like money. It's just weird. Like people get money, like they attract money. It pulls it to them because they're valuable to the economy, right? I don't know. But, but the solution I think is culture. It goes to my, my point. With the middleman minority, what Thomas O is highlighting <clears throat> that this phenomenon is not race specific. It's not just the Koreans in, in, in Los Angeles. It's not just the Jews in America. It's not just the Jews in Germany. It's not just the, uh, the Yoruba people in Africa. It's just, it's, it's not just 
um, the Asian uh, cultures in this area, this area, whatever. But he's highlighting various anecdotal stories and stuff of a culture of people who come into a place and they may have unique niches about their cultures, but what is very common is that you see, they typically stick together. They typically have values and principles. They sacrifice tremendously. They have really a, above average responsibility. They hold nobody else accountable to educate them. They hold nobody else accountable to pay them. They hold nobody else accountable to change laws. They hold nobody else accountable for anything, really. They create their own schools. They, they are nine times, I think 10 times out of 10, they all become entrepreneurs in that initial generation. And then once the entrepreneurial st standpoint is there and the economic base is established foundationally, then they pay for more formal education. Second and third generations are typically more educated and they become high-end professional white collar situations like doctors and attorneys, et cetera, et cetera. Like how you see a lot of Asian doctors and, and, and Indian doctors and, and, and like, you know, Jew doctor, whatever. Those are second, third generations where their parents are primarily entrepreneurs and stuff. And he points a lot of different, where some entrepreneurial endeavors become really huge, like Levi Strauss derived from that middleman minority of the Jewish family. And then also some other like retail stores as well. And they're middlemen, not just eth ethnically, the term derives from them being uh, not quite in the low class that is native to that culture, and then not quite the high class that is native to that culture, or not native per se, but just prior to them arriving. And they become the middlemen, both in ethnically, economically, and sometime in their professions, or even in a middleman kind of broker standpoint, where they kind of buy wholesale and then sell retail. Again, middlemen. They don't produce or manufacture, but they kind of buy it wholesale at a certain price and they add a premium in the retail situation, right? Same thing with investment banking, a lot of other professions that are very middlemen-esque that derives from these middlemen uh, minorities. My point in bringing this up though, is highlighting the commonality across this culture that is creating wealth. Wealth is created and derived and attracted to culture and who you are and habits and your behaviors and stuff. Just get, and, and, and you can even see, again, another example of the destruction of just throwing, of just, of just trying to kind of just change, um, uh, trying to just change like the natural flow of things where people win the lottery, right? Winning the lottery is <laughs> like, um, this is, this is absurd, but I'm thinking about sometimes like when you look at death rates, you look at, you know, cardiac health, diabetes, and lottery, and winning the lottery, because like the mortality rate of people after you win the lottery, it's like, it's like, can't, it's like drugs, it's like, I don't know, it's like suicide or something, it's crazy, because what happens is money does not make you wealthy, you make you wealthy, and then money is kind of how you measure that wealth, right, it's like you make yourself wealthy by who you are, because you're valuable, like it's like you even hear the stories about how Donald Trump and other people went bankrupt a million times, whatever, and then boom, they become wealthy because it's not money that does it. It's who they are that does it. Money is just the, is just the uh, confirmation that, yes, you're, you're actually wealthy. It's almost like muscles don't make you strong. You become strong mentally. And then based on your behaviors of going to the gym and your habits of going to the gym and working out situation, you earn the six pack and you earn the muscles and stuff. And that is who you and it becomes the result of all your work. That's the same thing with wealth. Like it becomes a result of all your work. And if you just give a person muscles, what are they gonna do? It's crazy. You didn't earn that. Like it's weird. Isn't there a stat out there that says like 95% of people who win the lottery go, go back to being poor like within three or four years? Yeah, so I don't know the statistic, but it's something like that where it's like some of them is, you know, they die. Like they, they kill them. It's dangerous. They kill themselves. It's like they, it's like weird stuff. Well, well, yes, they go back to being poor, but it's another statistic, that metric that measures like they end up dying for some kind of reason, like they owe somebody money or somebody owe them money or something crazy happens. Because again, it's not, because you have to understand that it's not the money that does it. He even mentioned that some people, if you, if everybody became uh, even economically, some people will actually turn out okay. It goes to my point of being the arrogant imperialistic person who comes into a certain narratively a popular narrative the um uh, a popularly like understood to be like this is a poor community right you go into the community just help people out it's like it's, it's arrogant and strange and they're not looking for your help if they just kind of are who they are they're just rocking how they rocking right 
But some people, some of those individuals be like, hey, looking for help, looking because you hear the rags to riches story all the time. So people do it because of who they are. They may be able to use your help. And then if you were to make everybody even, these people who are just natural, like, yo, if you give me, you put me anywhere on God's green earth, I'm going to triple my, my worth, quoting Jay-Z, right? It's like, because of who that person is, they're, they're going to take your help, take your money, and be incredible, right? But all the intelligence, the it's, it's the internal, it's who a person is, it's the character, it's their values, it's their culture, and put them anywhere. Like the middle and minority, literally just did, they, they, they put them anywhere on God's green earth. And they'll figure it out because of who they are. They then attract an economic, an economic. Um, they then create economic circumstances and conditions that are that are to their benefit. That are that are not that are not impoverished at all. They have a wealthy as a wealthy culture is what's wealthy. The culture is. So this is a lot of story I always remember when I talk about this. So this family won the lottery in Kentucky, right? And had a six their family. They bought everyone a Ferrari, right? Sure. Six months later, the Ferraris were totally ruined because they did not pave the dirt road. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that before. I've heard that before. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny. And they can't even sell it to make money. But they don't even think like that, right? It's, it's like the how they think. It's like it's who they are. It's like, you know, but it, it's, it's not, and I don't even think that was the bad thing or the wrong thing. They had fun, man. Let them enjoy the money, right? Yeah. You know, it's, but it's but it, it answers a lot of questions and, and it provides more further insight into it, right? Like do what you want to do with your money, have fun, do your thing. Like who am I to be arrogant and imperialistic to tell you how to spend your money? But you can kind of predict what's going to happen, right? Because if they're that way, they're going to be that way. You know, if, if they were meant for something else, they would have something else, right? If they were, you, you can, like money, what, what, I, what I came to the conclusion when I was in high school, I had this sound like money does not, Money is like, it exposes who you are. Money is like volume. Like money just turns the volume up on who you already are, right? Whoever, whatever you're doing, money just turns it up. You can just do what you're doing a lot more. Like if you're like strung out on drugs and you have addiction problems, whatever, if you give a person some money, they're gonna just do more, you know? If a person is like spending their money like crazy, buying wild stuff, whatever, you give them money, they're gonna just do more. If a person is saving their money, trying to invest money, trying to buy passive income generating assets, they're trying to close the racial wealth gap and make the community better, whatever. You give them money, they're going to do all that on a louder level. It's all. It just kind of exposes it. It doesn't really change as much as it is. It changes the volume. It doesn't change like culture, though, you know, per se. Yeah. So you have uh, several licenses, I think. Series 79 investment banking license, Series mm -hmm. 7 general security license, and a Series 63 security agent startup something. Yes. Why are these important? Do, does everyone get these? Are they something you have to study for? It's a part of the certification process. It is correct. Yeah. So when you're um, working formally in uh, the securities industry, uh, the securities meaning like um, um, stock is considered a security. Uh, certain debt like bonds are secured, is considered a, a security. You fall under the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, laws and level of enforcement. And the licensing agency is called FINRA, the Financial Industry National Regulatory Authority. And they kind of like enforce some of those laws. Uh, could you hold for just one second? I'm yeah. sorry. Um, it's my wife. <laughs> hey, baby, I'm actually on a podcast right now. Can I call you back? Okay, we'll do it. She's on tour. She's awesome. <laughs> um, the, um, the, the licensing is necessary just, just to, you know, like make sure that uh, you're following certain laws. The, the agency and laws and license, whatever, really is, it exists really to protect consumers. You know, pe people like yourself who are not in the industry, but will, um, who currently are or may become a client. Of, of mine or anybody in my industry. So when you buy stocks and you work with uh, stockbrokers or investment bankers or anybody who's in the industry, uh, we have to follow a set of laws and guidelines that are mostly, actually 100% in your benefit. We're to protect you and to make sure that, you know, you're treated fairly, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'll, I'll say like 90% of our, our laws and our rules and stuff are really to protect uh, consumers. The SEC actually was created 
to protect uh, consumers after 1933, like the stock market crash, like in the 1930s or whatever, like around there. And then uh, what they saw the outcry was, and the reason was is because certain individuals were just buying stock willy nilly and not even knowing what they were buying or being misled or, you know what I mean? Or, or being um, mistreated and uh, abused and taken advantage of because of their, their financial illiter Ill illiteracy. And so the SEC was created and then laws and stuff were created like the Surgical Exchange Exchange Act 1934 and 33. Like all these things were just created really to protect consumers so to not, not happen again. So we have these things called accredited investors and then qualified purchasers. These designations are given to certain consumers who have a certain amount of wealth, uh, like a million dollars or five million, a million dollars plus for accredited investors, we call them AIs, five million plus for qualified purchasers. And only certain opportunities are eligible for AIs and QPs, you know, and then other people are given, um, you know, less riskier, you know what I mean, uh, investment opportunities. But yeah, these licenses are necessary for people who work in the securities industry uh, formally. And then also uh, these laws exist to protect uh, consumers. So quick list for everyone, no matter what you're doing, if your wife calls, always answer the phone. Yeah, man. <laughs> She's on tour, man. She's been singing background for Jackson Brown since she was in her uh, teens. And so um, they just went back on tour from being like, you know, COVID, obviously, whatever. So it's yeah. her first time back on back on the road. She's been gone for a few weeks now. And, um, you know, I love her tremendously. I think she just left Connecticut. She was in West Virginia earlier. And then before that, she was in Akron, Ohio, and then Chicago. So she just, you know, hidden, hidden like different places and stuff. So, yeah. um, Madison Street Capital has actually won some of a few awards of the last few years. Like right. one is um winner of the 14th annual Turnaround Award in 2020, 2019, the winner of the 11th annual International MA Awards. Yeah. Like I had no idea there was such an award category, right? It's, yeah. I, I yeah. have to presume this is a pretty big thing, right? It is. And, it and is. You, like, so, brag I, about. <laughs> so our, our our industry is like segmented into like bold bracket and middle market and then lower middle market. Um, which which is which is segmented by size and deal size, and so um, we we've we've closed like this year we've closed I want to say eight eight deals, um, you know about eighty five million dollars in total deal size on those eight deals, so the average deal size being like ten something million whatever. So we we do um, what's called middle market deals and stuff. So they're not huge huge, like uh, and then we have formal partnerships with other bulls bracket institutions to where when they have small deals that are below 300 million in size, we come in and help them close those deals and stuff. And so, uh, so when you focus on the middle market or the lower middle market where we typically work, um, we typically are the 800 pound gorilla in the room that are like, you know, heavily specialized. A lot of our, our senior partners have over 20 to 25 years of experience in the industry. Uh, they're, they're super specialized and, and we, we work uh, on what's called a sector agnostic basis meaning that we're not specific. We don't focus on any specific sectors, but we focus across all sectors. And then we're also geographically ag agnostic, which again, we cover from San Francisco to Maine, right? And even all the way to Spain. Like we, we do international deals as well. We have an office in Accra, Ghana, where our CEO is actually from. So we're actually black owned, um, which is one of, the, uh, one of the reasons why I really like, um, you know, Madison Street Capital as well. You know, I'm all for, Diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, so what is a merge and acquisition? How does that how does that even work? It sounds real complicated. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not actually. You know, not at all. So, it's essentially, um, you know, what you heard about. Um, I think it was AT and T and Sprint. Maybe I don't know if AT and T and Sprint, but but you know, I think like uh, maybe it might have been like Sprint and T Mobile or I yeah, I think it's Sprint and T Mobile. Nextel, Nextel and Sprint. I think it was Nextel and Sprint, right? Next sale and sprint. I think so. Obviously, I don't focus on the telecommunications, not clearly, <laughs> clearly. But but when you when you hear about big mergers like that, right? Like next sale and sprint, I think did, did this merger a while ago. Or um, when you when you discover when you look at your uh, M and M's like candy, and you look at the back and you see that it's just owned by Mars, right? It's like oh wow. So th these are these are mergers when two companies merge or one company acquires another company. 
So what happens is like as a CEO, you may be, um, you know, running your business in the healthcare space and you're doing your thing or you have maybe you're doing these roll ups, you're acquiring a lot of companies and stuff, whatever. And you want to, um, you know, truly expand even further. Uh, you may hire an investment banker like myself. And what we can do is walk you through uh, the process of like um, formally and strategically acquiring another business or um, selling your business. So we focus on two different verticals. We focus on M&A, which is you know, we work on merging companies and we, we, help, we help businesses merge one another and we help businesses acquire uh, other businesses. That's M&A, we're the first with an acronym. And we also help business owners raise capital as well. So and capital could be raised for growth purposes, uh, acquiring purposes, working capital for the next uh, few years or, or a few quarters maybe, yeah. And so um, talk about the advantages or challenges of being an international firm. Yeah, sure. So uh, challenges is always like, you know, uh, a lot of paperwork and uh, the paperwork is very interesting. It's, it's a lot of red tape, administrative stuff. Uh, and then also there's a lot of like, um, like risks as well uh, because physical presence is not being there. And then you have uh, just political risk in that country and then stability risk all kinds of things different, at different countries and stuff, right? Because uh, some, a lot of times, and, and, and you know, in our country it's the same way, like laws are typically in favor of the, the natives there, right? And so <laughs> it's a bit skewed, but then you have to have like, you know, boots on the ground, people there and, and seeing what's, what's going on. So a lot of times you'd have to travel and actually kind of just meet belly to belly eyeball to eyeball with various clients and counterparts you're working with to kind of just make sure you can reduce a lot of those risks that I just named. Uh, political stability, other other types of risks as well. Fraud, it's, you know what I mean? How, how do you uh, take action and recourse in case something were to happen or, or, or go south or go left? You know, and they're like all the way, like in, in Europe or some African country or some South American country, right? So, so that's like the risk that involved and we mitigate that by having people we trust on the ground and then being able to travel down there uh, ourselves and dotting our I's and crossing our T's with certain uh, governmental agencies who are aware of our presence there uh, making it happen. The cons, are, the, the pros are, are pretty obvious there. Like, right, you, you, you have much more uh, of a larger footprint to kind of like take more market share. And then you also are able to kind of like impact uh, more and more people like, you know, we're all big on, you know, being the possibility of people being empowered, fulfilled and fully self-expressed. I mentioned that that is who I am. And I mean, I'm that as well in my career is how I show up. So being able to empower, fulfill and help uh, these entrepreneurs fully express themselves from a business standpoint and a career standpoint um, with their family and their community. is huge to me, you know, uh, especially when they're from the African continent. I have a special love uh, for the African continent, but we work with uh, businesses like in, in, in South America, as well as, you know, Europe, you know, as well as Asia as well. What, what's your process for evaluating how much a company is worth? How's that work? Yeah, so um, that's our valuation uh, department. And so uh, from 30,000 feet, we have uh, just, I'm just going to be real low resolution here. <laughs> but but there's, um, there's like uh, three popular methodologies. You have a discounted cash flow analysis. You have a comparable uh, company analysis, uh, DCF, comparable company analysis. And then you have um, DCF, comparable company. And then you have, um, what is that? Uh, 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 ah, man, DCF, comparable company analysis. And escapes me. But it's, it's a multiple, it's, a, it's like a multiple analysis where you look at a, a president transaction analysis. My apologies. Yeah, so you look at a transaction that had just happened. It's very much akin to like a, a car, even like any major asset. You know how like Kelly a Blue Book, I always use this example to help people kind of understand it. When you're looking at Kelly Blue Book is a very popular way to value your car, right? And what Kelly Blue Book typically does is those first two, it's president transaction analysis and they look at comparables. So what they typically do is look at, you know, what if you have like a blue Honda, you know, and I look at like what other blue Honda sold recently in your area? Right. And what did they sell for? Right. Because in economics, the price of something is how much somebody is willing to pay for it. So you see this phenomenon with classic cars. Right. So a classic because classic cars sell for more money because they're just, you know, the 
the, if, if the buyer demands it and the seller is like pushing back, it can push up the price, right? Supply and demand really. So if there's like a high demand for it and they're in low supply, it pushes it up further. And so then that Shelby 65 Mustang is worth that much money versus like a, a blue Honda Civic from 1997. You know, they're much, they may be in greater supply and there's low demand for it. So the price is, again, still based on president transaction. They look at like transaction that has just take place that are nearby to then tell you your, your, your valuation is right around here. And that's how the market price. Same thing with houses as well. Houses are the same thing. If like recent, recent transactions taking place that are nearby, it's technically called precedent transaction analysis. And then comparable market analysis is the same thing as well. We kind of like look at, you know, similar, similar situations and what is worth and inherent of, of itself. And then the unique situation, the unique valuation methodology we utilize is called, uh, it's an acronym DCF, stands for a discounted cash flow analysis. What we do is we project the cash flows out into the future. And then we find what's called the discount rate to kind of like uh, we divide those cash flows by a discount rate to kind of like bring it into the future, counting a uh, certain risk in the market to kind of like um, the risk that will be involved in producing this, this cash flow. We reduce it by that. We discount it by that. We simply then we take, simply just add those cash flows up, and then that's the discounted cash flow analysis. Um, well, it's it's a bit again it's low resolution. This is <laughs> it's a lot more <laughs> a lot more detail than that from thirty thousand feet. As DCF, compare market analysis, and, and, and precedent transaction analysis, how we typically do it. So next, let's talk about raising capital. Sure. From your, sure. From your experience, what are people getting wrong about raising capital, and what, what should they be doing to make the process easier on them as a as, as a founder or someone who's raising money for whatever reason? Yeah, this is hilarious. You know, so like, what, what's funny? I work with a ton of clients. I work with a ton of clients, and, and you know, they they, they just kind of approach. Raising capital is like who you know with money, you know, and we just go ask these people with money. I'm just like, I'm just like, dude, like, just because you know wealthy people, I mean, like, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, they kind of, oh, they kind of oversimplify it as well, and they undermine um, the level of sophistication and professional that 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 is involved with raising capital. That you know, and, and also, but I, I guess too to. To their point, to their point, there's there's levels to this, right? To their point, right? If you want like unsophisticated investors and you just want money, then sure, if you're raising just a handful, a handful of like, you know, 100,000, 200,000, whatever, then, you know, just ask the homie with money, right? Like a friends and family round kind of thing, right? But as you start to get into like larger numbers and you want much more sophisticated investors because you're not looking for just money, you want what we call in the industry smart money. Well, an investor will not just invest capital, but they also will, will bring a lot of other things to the table as well. They'll bring like market intelligence, they'll bring networking, they'll bring opportunities for you to collaborate and exercise certain synergies with other institutions and sister companies and parent companies possibly to kind of get you ready to, to like really just move to the next strategic the next strategic step, which may be, you know, being uh, an acquisition target for a larger strategic, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of things that you can, you, you should be, um, I think you could be uh, considering if you want to take a much more sophisticated uh, approach. But if you're looking for like 50 racks or something like that, then you may just be looking for somebody with some money to just throw at you or whatever. But, but then also too, there's a, um, quite a bit of, um, when you're taking money from people, just in general, people or in, in, institutions, when you're taking in money, there's a quite a bit of um, back office stuff that needs to be considered in terms of like, you know, if you're going to be taking in debt, you know, what are those terms? If you're going to be taking in equity, when you're taking in equity, it's a bit more stickier because you're 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 then falling into securities laws, right? Where you have to either, you know, notify your state and and federal uh, SEC uh, offices and either. You know, claim that hey, we're we're going to be falling under what's called regulation uh, regulation D under the SEC laws. That like, hey, we're not a we're not we're exempt from registering our security. We're not a security, whatever. There's a lot of like formalities that have to happen when you start to give in equity, right? And if you're not uh, exempting yourself from from registering your securities, which because you're creating a security once you start to divvy out ownership in your in your corporation in terms of more than more than one person owns it, it falls into security stuff. And so when you're raising capital and you're selling ownership, it's it's SEC uh, 
it's SEC kind of like jurisdiction and you have to get behind them and get some attorneys involved or an investment banker who works with that, that uh, particular industry, that segment, which is early stage companies. And you make sure you dot your I's and cross your T's in terms of your, your SEC filings and, uh, and documentation that you're giving the investor. It's, it's, it's quite a bit of, uh, it's very litigious when you get into that uh, realm of raising equity. So yeah. according to pitch book, last year was a record breaking year for you, for you see you invest more money than ever. And already July 1st, they, they were at 90% of the record breaking year. Like where's all this money coming from? Like where's it gonna invest it in? Like smart money, really. I think most of it comes from smart money. Like you, you know this thing, uh, it's called the Pareto principle, right? Where uh, Pareto, you know, identified is the Italian identified that this 80-20 rule that kind of, we know what the 80-20 rule is, you know, it's Pareto was a guy, Italian. And so he noticed that it was this trend, um, whether it's in economics and sociology, and we start to see it in relationships. We see it like everywhere. It's like 80-20, it's everywhere you look. Uh, maybe even your podcast guests, there's an 80-20, right? Like people like, you know, if you look at a YouTube video, 20% are wise, 80% of it's there, right? You see the Pareto, Pareto principle everywhere. So it's always that, that top 20% who has most of the bread and most of the bread, cheese, and dough uh, derives from, you know, that 20% big money. So that's like those, and what we call institutional investors. Uh, and on the other side of institutional investors, you have retail investors or just smaller into smaller individuals, uh, typically family offices or human beings. Well, family offices and institutions. institution. So if you have like just rich, rich people, like I've told you about some of my clients and these are sophisticated clients in their own right. They're like really sharp people on franchises, partners at law firms and stuff. They're just, it's just funny sometimes. They're just like, who <laughs> you know that's rich? Like what? What we typically do is we, we look at uh, the opportunity and we essentially, we, we match it. We match it with individuals who's looking to expand their portfolio in that particular industry, specifically with, with a company like that. So it's, it's a level of sophistication where we're not, we're not fishing with the net. We're fishing with the harpoon, you know, when we typically go out, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not shooting with a shotgun, you know what I mean? Or a Tommy gun or automatic rifle. We're, 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 we're firing with the, with the rifle. It's very specific at who we're shooting at. So it's, it's high value. And then when we do that, we turn the pressure all the way up. So it's very concentrated, but we still go really heavy when we do hit very, very hard, you know? And so, um, Again, a lot of the money uh, is this smart money, you know, smart money typically, you know, you are who you attract, you are who you work with. And so these people we typically work with, they know us, we work with them prior to, they have a lot of what we call dry powder, meaning capital that they're ready to invest and it's ready to go. And with, and, and fun fact, just to, just to be clear here, these money, these people uh, are, are, these institutions are essentially money managers, right? So it's, so it's uh, only a percentage is their actual money, their proprietary funds. They're managing money from other wealthy individuals. So these wealthy individuals, you know, rather than they focus on trying to invest directly in themselves, rather than being independent, these wealthy individuals have reached the maturity continuum of interdependence. What we talked about with Stephen Covey and Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, right? They then take their money and entrust it with money managers who are smart and then they cooperate. And then these money managers manage multiple billions of dollars and then they strategically invest it on their behalf. Again, you see an interdependent relationship there on the maturity continuum of intelligence. When you come further down the food chain, you also come further down the maturity continuum and you see independent people who just like rich with money, right? And then you go even lower and you see dependent people saying, you owe me money. You should be giving me this money because I check these boxes and stuff and you demand this money. And it's just like 5,000, 50,000 dollars or some shit like that. You know, so that's interesting. That's where the money's coming from though. Smart money, interdependent money. So let's suppose there's someone watching this during college, freshman in college. It's like, man, I want to follow John's career path. I want to, I want to do what John's doing. What advice you'd have for this person? Yeah, so there's no book. <laughs> there's no book, man. So um, I, um, you know, I it was interesting because I really, I, I always just wanted to be rich, man. I always wanted to be rich and then free and financially independent, whatever. So uh, I, you know, 
I left classic nine to five corporate. I don't have a nine to five even now. Like as a managing director, I kind of create my own hours, but I, sometimes I work a lot more than your nine to five person. And sometimes I work a lot less. Well, I don't ever work less, but <laughs> I typically work a lot more than nine to five. But I, I think I've, I've been blessed and fortunate enough to kind of like realize the, um, I think of one of, I think a major awakening is when you're able to marry those four verticals I mentioned earlier that my wife and I have, the God, family, career, and community. Like when I was starting my career, we, I heard a lot about, uh, this term came up so much, uh, work-life balance, work-life balance, work-life balance, work-life balance. But from everybody I admired, <clears throat> they always kind of scoffed at that work-life balance and was like, work is life, life is work, you know, and it's kind of measures. And so I would never forget, started my career with JP Morgan, private wealth management at the time, the CEO of PWM, what we referred to it as private wealth management, PWM. The CEO at the time was this Wall Street legend. Her name is uh, Mary Erdos. And she talked to everybody, you know, in our, in our class, our analyst class, whatever. And she was like, that shit you hear. And she was very frankly, <laughs> what you're hearing about this whole work-life balance is like BS. She was like, you know, like my work is life. My life is my work. Like it, 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 it's all the same. Like when I'm working, my living, it's all fluid. And a lot of people in the analyst class was like, she crazy, she's a workaholic and she ain't gonna be married for a long time, blah, 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 blah. But a few of us, a few of us was like, nah, it's, listen, she's freaking Mary Erdos. Like, listen, there's something there. And if it's not resonating with you, look at, take that inward journey and like, what's up with you? You know, because you're the company you keep, like she's killing in our economy. So there's something there. And so later on in my life, um, one of the, the CEO of Fourth Movement, his name is Kareem Webb. Um, I talked to him about, it. this was like recent, right? A few years ago, I talked to him about it and he was like, work is life, life is work. But prior to Kareem even, I kind of noticed that I think you master this thing when you can see, um, like a lot of my business that I, that I generate and that I bring to the firm are friends that I've had since like 2008. I had the pleasure of just knowing the, my, one of my good buddies, uh, Mandel Crawley was just promoted as the chief human and human resources of, of Morgan Stanley. And I met him back in 2008 when I was an undergrad and I was like, kind of had this event at Morgan Stanley, we were talking and prior to being CEO of uh, uh, chief human resource officer of Morgan Stanley, he was the head of all private wealth management at Morgan Stanley. And so these are like friends and we were just friends on like, not a business level, he was just a buddy. We was like talking and sharing advice on stuff, whatever, like a buddy, buddy, you know? And so, Again, that's like life, but then it meshes with work. And so now we're talking about, you know, our firm getting on the platform, you know, so you see that happen a lot. I had a lot of my other big, big deals that I've done came from just really relationships where we're going out to eat and going bowling with these people, having dinners with these people. I, I know their their children and stuff. It's like life becomes work. And then your labor becomes a labor of love. where you are not working out of ob ob obligation or you have to work, but God, you know, flows into all that as well, because the, everything I do is for my family pillars and not to put my family pillars, my exercise, my nutrition, then the God vertical of uh, my empower regimen, exercise, meditation, pray, write and read. Like I write about and I meditate on what's happening in my family and my career and my community. And then my family becomes people I work with. Right. Because I work with my family. Like my wife is a client of mine. Right. So then that starts to happen. And then career and community starts to happen because my community I do community related projects through my fraternity, Kappa League, et cetera, et cetera. So my community becomes family, becomes my fraternity brothers. So they all start to mesh. So it's like this whole work-life balance. You start to see where work become life, life become work. And it's all just kind of a beautiful thing that may require some time to, to realize. And so if somebody wanted to, you know, replicate my career path, this is a spiritual inward journey. It's just an inward journey. It's an inward journey more so than it is climbing a corporate ladder uh, stay inward, you know, and, you know, your path may, for sure, is not going to be mine, for sure, like, we all have different paths, but if you want to emulate it in, in, in any kind of way, I would encourage you to take the inward journey, and even maybe take the, take a, the book, shout out to Howard, Howard Thurman, you know, Howard Thurman was Martin Luther King's mentor, spiritual mentor, and also professor at uh, Morehouse College, but Howard Thurman had, I kept saying it over and over during this whole podcast, but 
Howard Thurman is the author of The Inward Journey, you know, and uh, that book helped a lot, but then just literally doing it, like literally like meditating and turning within, you know, and then realizing and waking up to the power of taking responsibility over your life economically, socially, professionally, romantically, every, every kind of way and not holding anybody accountable for anything and just getting it done. Yeah, as for work-life balance, I think we got to get a point where like, if you're working with someone and your kid has a school play from two to four, you can go do that school play to two, four, two to four without no repercussions. However, a comma, yeah. if you had a big project at eight the next morning, you still got to figure out how to do that project, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I just think about yeah. like people trusting each other to do the right thing eventually. Yeah, this is true. Interdependence, right? Interdependence. Yeah. yeah. So what is it that you do as a manager director? Yeah, so I, I uh, bring deals to the firm. So I have a lot of relationships across uh, Wall Street and across like this different industries and um, socially, professionally, just I'm in different networking groups, I'm memberships at different organizations, city club memberships and all kinds of stuff. And so I just go out and network really every single day. And I, like today, I'm like, that's why I, that's why I have the, the, uh, the hard stop at the time that I just told you. I'm having dinner with, um, you know, a major Wall Street firm, the national head of this firm, and we're discussing getting on the, the platform. And I met them at this art gallery that my wife and I, so I have friends with, I'm a member of this organization, ACG, Association of Corporate Growth, and I uh, met this guy. He's a, he's a wealth manager there. We've been talking for about a year now. And I talked about getting on the, uh, the platform formally as, a, as a, joining their referral network. And then he, he invited my wife and I to this uh, art gallery thing that was happening on the west side of Los, Los Angeles. Attended was like the two of their national heads of like sales and mergers and acquisitions, et cetera, et cetera. We talk, we connect and we're like, yo, let's, let's have lunch and let's discuss making this happen. And so I'm going to the lunch today. But my calendar is filled with stuff like that, like various events and things I go to and I meet folks who are entrepreneurs who are earning at least a million dollars or more in their uh, earnings before interest tax depreciation amortization. I find out that they need help raising capital. They're looking to sell their business and stuff. And I bring that to Madison Street Capital. So we have about 60 professionals globally. And so we have a business system. It's interdependence here. So I'm not independently doing everything myself or, 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 or dependent on them to everything, but we it's a symbiotic cooperation where we kind of like work together. And so as managing director, I'm primarily tasked with bringing in the deals. But at a time when I was an analyst or an associate at different firms, you know, I did a lot of financial modeling and all kind of like, you know, I help prep, prep the fish. I go catch the fish and then they prep the fish and then we cook the fish and then we eat the fish when the deal is done, you know. But Can you talk I, about I've the points of networking, even at your level, like you're, you're still networking, oh, right? Jesus Can you Christ, talk about the points of that? that? every single day. I'm networking now, like through this podcast, like somebody's listening and they want to reach out. And at the end, we're going to, you know, share my kind of information. Somebody's going to reach out to me. And this is a form of networking for sure. So I network constantly every single day. I meet new people every single day, every day. I get an unsolicited email. I just got a, a, a text right now that came in and the name's not there. I don't know who this person is. Like literally you probably heard it came in. Like I network every single day. And I mean, I meet new people every single day professionally every single day. Here's a question for you. Like, I can't imagine how many emails, those list of emails, texts you get per day. Jesus Christ. <laughs> of, of, the, of, that, of the number you get, what percentage actually like pays off for you, if that makes any sense? You know, it's funny. It's funny. Um, it, I think they all will. I think I, I, I approach it as if they all will. That's how I approach it, as if they all will. Because I mentioned like the, my, my, my buddy at Morgan Stanley, right? Like we met in 2008 and we're just now monetizing our relationship in 2021. And so this is the meshing of the God family career and community I was telling, telling you about, right? Like I am genuinely the, the, the possibility of people being empowered, fulfilled and fully self-expressed. So I went into the relationship with my buddy it's just like him being a mentor and being a cool guy. He's African-American. I am too. He's working in finance. I was pursuing a career in finance. We're networking. We're talking. He's just a buddy. And he just happened to be climbing in his career. And so was I. And so when I went from undergrad to now managing director of a, of a global middle market investment bank, he was like executive director over a trading desk. And he's now in the C-suite of one of the world's largest investment banks, right? 
And so now we can opportunity to monetize, but I wasn't deliberately looking to do that. I was just looking to be the possibility of people being empowered, fulfilled, and fully self-expressed. And so I don't always kind of just look into like, I want to monetize this relationship now. It's like, how can I help, how can I help you, you know, be empowered? How can I help you, you know, be fully self-expressed? You know, how can I help you be fulfilled in whatever you're trying to do? How can I add value? And so I come in with that and I always, again, take full responsibility. So I hone my craft so I can be valuable, right? And then I just go in, like, how can I help you add value? And then oftentimes, like people like you, Jason, I come across and you're asking me, how can you add value to my life? And so when everybody kind of can come, you know, being independent and like not deep and like you demand because I'm because I check these boxes, Jason, you have to give me this. You have, I mean, that's kind of gross, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we can be interdependent when we're at least coming off of independence, right? And then that's kind of how I look at our relationships when I meet these new people every single day. You know, it's like, how can I add value? And then in some kind of way, we end up, you know, closing deals and making money together. And and then we use that money intelligently and in helping our community become better, enhancing financial literacy, closing the racial wealth gap, enhancing diversity, equity, and inclusion, et cetera, et cetera. Does the Madison Street Capital have an internship program? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not incredibly formal though, but yeah. So if, how does someone apply for that? What do you look for an internship? How does that process work? Yeah, so it's not formal. It does exist, but it's not formal because we're not a large bulls bracket institution, meaning that we're not a large popular, everybody know, knows our name, Wall Street firm kind of thing, like a Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan or whatever. Um, it's, it's a smaller shop. And so we don't have a huge demand uh, for an internship program. But right? I would just imagine someone at an internship with you would learn a lot more than going to Goldman Sachs, I would imagine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, everything's it's all relative, right? It's all relative. So what, what can happen is, um, you know, they reach out. You you can share my contact information. It's perfectly fine. Uh, when, when that happens is, um, you know, we kind of like speak to them and kind of like find out what can exist, you know, and that's kind of how we go. We just, you know, we share the information and, and people reach out because, some of my unsolicited emails come from people looking for internships, you know, like a lot of them actually do. And um, they just kind of like hustlers who kind of just push and just create opportunities rather than wait for people. They're not dependent. They're kind of independent. Just pushing, trying to create their own opportunity, which is I love. And so I admire that about them. And I reach out and we kind of have a meeting, whether it goes somewhere or not, I always take the meeting with like, you know, with college students. I mean, I, I, I always, I, don't know, I can always remember that time because I took a very non-traditional path. Although I went to JP Morgan, blah, 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 it still was very non-traditional. I end up where I was I always, you know, have a sweet spot and a soft spot for those kind of people. So, but it's so, not formal. So, okay. I, unfortunately I can't, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's Understand. Not, yeah. So John, is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't or anything you want to talk about that we did not cover? No, no, every, every, it's, it's, it's all good. No, I think, I think that's it. I think we checked a lot of boxes and I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to kind of like leverage your, your platform and talk to these, talk as many people as, as I can, you know, through your platform to kind of just share who I am with the world. I think I like to like, you know, make it a megaphone. I'm here to, to help people. Yes. So John, I understand you have something for our listeners. You, you want to give us our your contact information so people do like a 30 minute call with you or 30 minutes, something with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Um, my email address is W, is just the letter W, um, at hunterbaron.co. Again, that's just the letter W and that's at H-U-N-T-E-R-B-A-R-O-N.co. And so listen, if we have the link to his, his, his to that in his email on the show notes, find the show notes at www.cabinetshlblog.com. Don't forget to sign up for the waitlist for a better testing of our HR platform at www.cabinetshr.co. Don't forget to check me out on the two minute drill this Friday at 8 30 PM Pacific time on uh, Bloomberg TV and Amazon prime video. So John, what kind of a talk? Do you have any last minute wisdom or advice on anything you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, so my family pillars are agape authenticity and spiritual freedom. And one of these quotes have been on my heart for a very long time. I think it encourages authenticity and it encourages, um, you know, you to kind of just be you. Um, is from Brene Brown. And she said that you either 
you know, walk inside your story and own it, or you stand outside your story and hustle for your worthiness. And to me, what, what that encourages is like, when you see people oftentimes feel like they have to be something else to be accepted. And again, to me, acceptance is love. We have to try to be something else that you're not economically. You're trying to be something that you're not romantically. You're trying to be something that you know you're not um, socially or politically. You know, this is when you're kind of are standing outside of your story and you're trying to do things, ergo hustle for your worthiness. And I think your that worthiness ties to your acceptance and love. I think it's important to kind of like walk inside your own story and own it and, um, and really be you because like, um, you know, the world needs more people who are like them. Like uh, this, these common narratives don't need to be common. You know, I think people have a special tone, a special, a special sound that the world want to hear, a special taste, you know, that they can create in the kitchen or something like that, or, you know, a special aroma that they're kind of creating or whatever, right? So in all of our sensorium, a special look, you know, so be authentically you, you know, be authentically you. John, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. The pleasure is mine. Thank you so much, Jason. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.